Ladies and gentlemen, you are live, and we're coming to you from Washington, D.C., the nation's capital. We're not ashamed of the good news of conservatism, for it is the power of liberation, first to the Republican and then the Socialist. I'm yours truly, the exceptional one, and we have a great show planned for you. You know Tuesday night, I love. Janice Hall of the J. Hall World Report will be here tonight. We will be talking world affairs for the kitchen table, baby. We're going to bring it all down for you. Syria, Burundi, China, uh, and all the world. But in the first two quarters of our show, first half of our program at least, for those who are math deficient, <laughs> we will be talking about character. Picking up where we were last night. Last night we were talking about character. It's not an actor. It's an action. Well, tonight we're going to talk about the virtues of a victorious people. Yeah, there's a rhythm to the madness, people. In order to win back this country in order to bring it back in alignment with God to overcome the sins of our fathers and even our brethren is going to take a massive undertaking and it begins with character coming up how do we start this show take off your hats cover your right heart which is different from your left heart. <laughs> Cover your heart. We're about to pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Buenas tardes, niños. This is Spanish with Señora Cabrera. Today we will learn how to say the Pledge of Allegiance in Spanish. In English, we say, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, mm -hmm. one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now, in Spanish we say, Juro fidelidad a la bandera de los Estados Unidos de América y a la república que representa una nación bajo Dios, indivisible, Con libertad y justicia para todos. Muy bien. Practice your pledge of allegiance. And the more you practice, the faster you will memorize. And I will see you now. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the most fantastical, most influential urban conservative talk show in the free world. Yes, yours truly, the exceptional one, is here. Prince Tardis. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, what a big night last night was. Uh, and I really enjoyed having a conversation about some world affairs. We talked with Lonnie Poindexter from the Urban Family Talk Network. He is the host of Lion Chasers, which comes on Mondays through Fridays from 9, uh, forgive me, 11 to 1 p.m. 8 a.m. on the West Coast or Left Coast. Uh, and we were talking about the issues in Missouri, uh, which is basically a uh, Leninist overtaking of the collegial system. Uh, and so you are beginning to see the, uh, the, the, the entree, the, the uh, revolutionaries that have been born or bred over the past 10 years in America, uh, fashion with the Occupy movement, fashion with the monies of George Soros, fashioned into the Black Lives Matter movement. Well, you, you're really just looking at the Marxist, uh, Leninist uh, strategy uh, for taking over a nation. And it's good that you see the seeds being dropped because there's some things you can do. You can remove the seeds become, before they become soiled and watered and start growing uh, and thus weeding out the place. 
<laughs> didn't mean marijuana, but if it fits. Uh, and so there's some things that we need to do to make certain uh, that our children and our children's children inherit a constitutional federated republic or federated constitutional republic or something to that effect something that the uh, underground professor would enjoy me saying uh, it, you know if you listen to a show last night some moron came on this program uh, that was fun to listen to <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen uh, I first want to go uh, to our chat roll uh, and, and you know I, I love my chat roll folk um, especially the one and only uh, Mary Brockman, who is my bouncer. If you diss her, you diss me, and you will be dismissed. I am so glad that she's here tonight. Also joining us tonight is Mrs. Biggs, my beloved, my betrothed, my wife. Uh, and she's watching via live stream and you stream. I want to thank the good people at live stream because they saved me last night. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why I invest in two. Uh, strategies for filming this particular program on a nightly basis. Live stream kept going and they kept filming. Great job, thank you. Uh, you stream screwed, uh, but uh, hopefully things will be better this evening. There won't be any issues or any problems. Uh, <laughs> I am white tonight, Mary. Yes, yes, I am. I got a little gray here. Uh, no, no, not the beard, not the beard, the t-shirt, the t-shirt, here we go. Um, tonight we're going to pick up basically where we need to. Um, there's so many of us clamoring for us to take back this nation, for us to win hearts and minds and souls to the causes of liberty, freedom and justice. I, I want to go very quickly because, and, and before I uh, forgive me for starting and, and not doing this first, to the Marines. There we go. I got this this bear for my wife, but she allows it to stay and watch me do the show. There we go. For the Marines. There we go. Congratulations. Uh, <laughs> Congratulations, 240 years. God bless America. Thank God for the Marines. From the shores of Montezuma to the halls of Tripoli. Thank God for the Marines. The Marines have been there for us fighting battles uh, that very few people wanted to fight. Uh, these are chosen men, especially chosen men. So happy birthday. Uh, to each and every Marine who currently serves and each and every Marine who is a veteran uh, or has served uh, at some state uh, in the U.S. Marine Corps. God bless you. I remember my first summer job out of high school uh, was serving the U.S. Marine Corps in the food uh, management area. Uh, bean counting, that's basically what it was, bean counting. So, <laughs> I, I counted the MREs and the rations and things of that particular nature. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that was me. And I want you all to know that while I was there, every Marine got his ration. I don't know if you liked it. <laughs> I saw what was in that bad boy. Whoa, whoa. It makes you really love a Big Mac. That's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, Dave Milner's joining us tonight. God bless you, sir, the underground. Forgive me, the unpleasant blind guy. Who also hangs out with the underground professor. Uh, it's with us tonight. So uh, we are uh, getting ready to get underway. Um, and uh, there was one other thing, and I can't think of that particular thing. But I, I know a lot of people were upset that we... Uh, that they couldn't via Ustream see last night's show uh, with all the breaks and things like that. But you can go to the exceptional conservative show.com 
uh, and scroll down to live stream. You can listen and watch the show from there, from last night, or you go to the Facebook pages of the Exceptional Conservative Show or Kenneth McClinton, and you'll be able to see last night's shows. And I do apologize for all the technical difficulties involved. When we come back, we're going to be talking about character. We are going to talk about leadership. Uh, and you might note that for virtually the rest of this month, and maybe going into next month, this will be a classroom assignment on how to take the next steps. It's not good enough just to win. We not only have to win, but we have to also lead. You're listening to the Exceptional Conservative Show, live from the nation's capital. I'm your truly the exceptional one. We'll be right back. Right swipe. Let me right swipe. This man just shaved his chest hair into a heart. Aww. You stole mine. Right swipe. Right swipe. Right swipe. That kind of looks like my sister. It does. Oh, she's not. He's cuddling a kitten. Oh my god, I want to eat their faces. She's, oh, she's hot. Oh, wait a minute. Oh. That's a butterfly. Oh, that is not a lollipop. Let's swag. Let's swag. But you talk hashtag flex. Yeah, you work out, you're in shape, okay. I like the six pack abs, not the six packs a day. Came across a photo of his green eyed body, home nine, pretty face, tight waist, nice body. Hottie! I just couldn't overlook one small fact. She smokes like an old man at a racetrack. Yeah. This Let me tell you about our infused heat burn. 
when we keep the spikes up just a little bit with our infused sauce. We start off with 80-20 USDA ground chuck ham patty burgers, like half a pound of burgers, and we're going to grill it to perfection. Yeah. After I flip the burgers, we add the sauce and then cook on it to the music a little bit. commercial uh infused restaurant you all know it and if you come to washington dc you gotta stop by infused it is the best <sighs> oh gosh forgive me every time i see chris make that burger it, i i i'm angry that it's not my burger i'm talking about the way they oh Quarter pound burger, oh, real meat. I mean, just real meat. Oh, 63 30. And forget what the UN says or the World Health Organization says. Listen, we're all going to die from something. We might as well taste it and see that it's all good. Uh, 63 39, Allentown Road, Temple Hills, Ray Plus. You can get bacon on it. You can even get a bacon pancake at this place. Uh, Temple Hills, Maryland, 20748 301-449-9000, 301-449-9000. This is that particular hour of the night. While you're listening to the show, you can order your burger. Get out there. Get your burger. Come back. We'll still be on the air. Uh, and then you can tell me all about how good it tastes because it does taste good. I'm not going to lie to you. It's addictive. It really is infused restaurant. I want to welcome you back to the Exceptional Conservative Show, live from the nation's capital. We are not ashamed of the good news of conservatism, for it is the power of liberation, first to the Republican and then the Socialist. We want to also tell you about stockings for soldiers, because the benevolent dictator uh, of Conservative Commandos Radio Network wouldn't allow me to do it any other way. Uh, listen, Stockings for Soldiers out of Delaware was founded to help improve the morale and welfare of members of the armed forces of the United States of America deployed in harm's way. And what better way since we are honoring the Marines today after 240 years than to donate? They accomplished uh, their mission by sewing holiday stockings and filling them with special items for the troops. Many of the stockings that are sent are for a specific person with their name on the stocking. Their name is actually on the stocking. This is why I love it so much. Uh, for many troops, uh, the gift that they receive from Stockings for Soldiers is the only one they'll receive for the holidays. It's the only one. Can you imagine what Thanksgiving uh, and Christmas must be like to a soldier who knows uh, that his family members are not wealthy enough to send something and and He's away from them, and this is it. This is all I got. The a bar of soap that I'll celebrate. Be grateful, but we could do a whole lot more. Uh, the Stockings for Soldiers group is trying to send a touch of home as well as personal messages of support to remind our troops that we appreciate all they do for us and to let them know that they have not been forgotten over the holidays. They depend on the generosity of others to help us to uh, help them accomplish. Uh, their vital mission, Stockings for Soldiers, Delaware Incorporated, is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. As such, donations are deductible to the extent allowed by law. Please consult your tax professional for more information. If you'd like to make a donation for the community project to help our soldiers out, please send your check to Stockings for Soldiers, Delaware Incorporated, 1911 F-O-U-L-K Road, Folk Road, Wilmington, Delaware, 19810. Do it, not because I asked, not because the benevolent dictator Rick Trader said so. Do it because our soldiers deserve a little break from the war. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's get into what we were talking about. Last night we were talking about the fact of the matter that a... Uh, mother in Chicago whose nine-year-old died was... Uh, 
that, that's, that's saying, that's saying what it really is. Uh, was targeted and killed. Nine-year-old. Targeted and killed by gang members. And the mother... Well, actually, let me precede that by saying that the aunt, realizing their impoverished state, knew that the mother, who did not have life insurance on the child, did not have the wherewithal uh, of financial support to get a grave site, to get a funeral home together, to get a uh, actual coffin, and all. Listen, it. Just from personal experience, I'm going to tell you, upwards of about twenty thousand dollars for an ordinary funeral now, about twenty thousand. So that kid that you got the twenty five thousand dollar life insurance policy on, that they'll be testing the limits in the coming years in terms of what it costs to put on a funeral uh, and all the other things that go along with it. Uh, we were blessed because our daughter was a good steward. Uh, and like her sister, they were both good stewards. Uh, uh, well, one is and the other was. Uh, and they took precaution against something that will happen in the future. They, You know you're going to die. I know I'm going to die. We're going to pass away. So you need to have a will and testament or trust of something set up. Uh, you have to have an executor of your estate. You have to have all these provisions. But in the impoverished communities, uh, living for the good times, uh, making your way as you can, temporary layoff, good times. <laughs> Why are you going through all that? Okay? Why are you going through all that? It's difficult to think of tomorrow. Uh, and certainly... Uh, the jealousy and envy that comes when you have not an inheritance to leave behind for your children and you look across and others do have an inheritance to give. So there's a great deal of animosity that comes from that. But l let me digress back to the story. The story of the matter is that the aunt decided to set up a GoFund account. And in that GoFund account, she was going to raise money so that the nine-year-old could be buried uh, that they can have a grave site, and, and so that she, the, the mother would not have to go through the persecution, self-persecution as well, of trying to find a grave site uh, and trying to afford it. I, I mean, you literally have to write a check uh, that won't cash, and, and you bounce that bad boy, and, and trust me, they will not do the tomb for you. They will not do the gravestone for you. It, it bounces. So There's so much involved, and people are grieving. So she wanted to give her a sense of peace. She didn't want to have a funeral. Where, and you know some of these funerals. And for all the urban brothers and sisters who are listening on the down low in urban America, you know how these funerals work. You come through the doors of the church, and then all of a sudden you hear click, click. You know what I'm saying? Sounds like the penitentiary. All of a sudden, the doors are locked. And nobody's getting out of here because the hat's going to go around three or four times to raise enough money to pay the preacher for the funeral. That's the way it works. And I know it works also in rural America the very same way. So this is not a racial thing. It's just a cost of living kind of thing. It's just a way of life kind of thing. Well, the aunt has set up the GoFund account. They have raised $17,000 in a short period of time. And so the aunt turned the money over to the mother of the nine-year-old, thinking that the mother would use the money to buy the child a plot or a tombstone or a gravesite or at least a coffin. Uh-uh. Everybody go, uh-uh. Wave your finger. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. $17,000, she went out and she bought a 2015 Chrysler 300. Now, $17,000 is not enough to pay off the Chrysler 300. It isn't. It just ain't. And, and somebody's going to look it up for me on the internet and, and get back with me while I'm talking about this. The Chrysler 300 is, is, is we're talking about at least thirty thousand dollars. Am I correct? Uh, <laughs> I, I'm thinking about thirty. 
And, and if I'm not right, yeah, just let me know. But I'm thinking thirty thousand dollars for a 2015 uh, Chrysler 300. In fact, let me just look that up while we're on the air here, because I don't want to tell anybody. Uh, let's go with the limited. Let's find out how much uh, the limited costs here. Chrysler 300. Okay, the limited, and uh, let's see exactly how much that bad boy uh, costs. Mm. And, and we're looking at listings here. $22,000. $22,000. That's the limited edition. That's a great deal. Uh, and that's with 18,000 miles on it in San Antonio, Texas. So if there's someone listening here tonight who thinks that you can't sell cars through the internet radio program, the Exceptional Conservative Show, I probably just sold this person's car out in San Antonio, Texas uh, on Car Gurus. <laughs> I probably just sold it. 18,764 miles. I, I think that's overly priced. Uh, 18,000 miles on it already in San Antonio, Texas for $22,000. And I know it's a 2015, but 18,000, it's just, it's a brand new car. It's only a year old. You got 18,000 miles on it now. Uh, you probably want to sell that junker for about 15 k But the bottom line is uh, the car is more expensive than the $17,000 that was raised. More expensive. Thank you, Dave. 17 grand won't get much. So she had to have used seventeen thousand as down payment on the car that she got. <sighs> Wait a minute! Aren't we supposed to bury the child? Aren't we, we're supposed to bury the child, aren't we? <laughs> Eventually, I guess. I don't. Know. Maybe we'll have a funeral next month or something. Maybe down write a check or something. The woman, the mother, used the mother of the nine-year-old used the money to buy a Chrysler 300. Character, character, character is that symbol that's marked, and I want to put this in the chat roll. You trust me, we're not going to run out of time tonight. We got a lot of stuff. We're going to be covering these type of issues for the next few weeks because we're gonna we're gonna graft a successful people we're gonna graft a successful people I want you to understand that character and I'm looking at the etymology dictionary as I'm talking with you okay uh, but we're looking at the French term the old French we're looking at a symbol marked or branded on the body. You know, you, everybody calls it my. You see my tat? You see my tat? You know, ladies, please don't get a butterfly tat um, because gravity chips in and it turns from a butterfly to a moth. Long, it, it, just don't do it. Uh, I would tell you not to get a tat uh, unless you are a marine. Uh, Semperfy, you know, something like that. Uh, but. Symbol marked or branded on the body. Uh, for the Latin, it means an engraved mark. It's an indelible mark, per se. It's your character reveals. You you can't as much as you try it. Do you know how much makeup a model has to wear in order to cover up all the tats? Because they're not going to let you go down the runway with the tats on. They, it's just, not unless you have a San Francisco designer who's doing that kind of thing, right? or a, a wild and rambunctious New York designer, but the bottom line is they're not going to let you go down with their nice new dresses or suits with tats all over your, no, they, they don't want to see that, so they have to use lots of makeup to cover that mark. And many of us use a whole lot of makeup called lies to cover the character flaws that have been scratched or marked upon our lives. When we look at the term character, we also note uh, from the 1640 period that it referred to the sum of qualities that define a person. 
what defines you? It, it can't be the Jer Jordans that define you. The Air Jordans don't do that. There are certain qualities that you possess that define you and make you the leader you're supposed to be. And I'm going to tell you right now, all of us has flaws. All have flaws. All have fallen short. All. So, it is keen for us to admit that we do have flaws. That we do have weaknesses. And it's someone's strength that covers our weakness. Just like our strength should cover someone else's weakness. But that's only if we have a certain defining quality. Something that says that this person is mature. There has to be something engraved on our hearts that tells us that we're mature enough to do this. To do what, Ken? Well, I listen to people all day long. I see Facebook. I see Twitter. I see Google Plus and probably Pinterest and LinkedIn. I, I look at all these things and there's a common denominator for a lot of people who are resistant in our society today. The common denominator is the phrase we need to take back. To admit that you need to take something back means either you gave it away or it has been stolen from you. Can we admit that? That somewhere in our DNA, somewhere in our character, we just find ourselves tolerant enough to allow that which made us free to be stolen from us. And so what we did was we exchanged tolerance for liberty and freedom. And so instead of facing down our enemies, we dined with our enemies and we compromised with our enemies. And then we told our enemies, it's okay what you do because what you do won't impact me. And then later on we find that the persons whose symbols are marked, who's engraved uh, with dire consequences for us, were continually taking power, continually taking wealth, continually taking things from us, that we either gave or they stole and we compromise that because we said maturity allows us to give up tolerant well give up our freedom and liberty for tolerance we are safe because we compromise when in all actuality the most unsafe people are the people who are Willing to compromise with those who have tax to their character. So what we have to admit is that, yeah, we gave it away. We gave away the Constitution when in 1913 an Alabama senator decided, why don't I just throw this income tax thing onto the floor of the U.S. Senate and see how that works. We gave it away when we allowed the 17th Amendment to pass, taking away the oversight of the U.S. Senate by the state legislatures. We have constantly given it away and affect allowing the Supreme Court to make decisions which take away our life, our liberty, and our pursuit of happiness. We continue to give it away when we say that we must vote for a man because of the color of his skin and not the content of his character. Ooh, not the content of his character. Ooh, not the content of the engraved marks on his being. The defining qualities of what makes him who he is. I listen to you all every day and we constantly get that phrase we need to take back well requiring us to take back requires us to have victory in order to take something back that has been stolen from you you must be willing to fight for it. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? 
Now, we have someone who is willing to fight for it. Uh, and he said he had a pen and a phone. That is how he fights. And you say that you want this country to be taken back. We understand not in time, we understand in principle. So let's do this, everyone. If we admit that something has been stolen from us, if we admit that something we gave is not being returned, uh, that there was an investment that we made that's not providing a return on that investment, then we need to take back the principal. Please write this down. Take back the principal. When we come back, I want to talk with you about taking back the principal. You see, we're talking about character, the virtues of a victorious people, tonight on the Exceptional Conservative Show. You're listening to us live from Washington, D.C. You're listening to us on Ustream, Livestream, Rebooting Liberty, SHR Media, Pundit Press Media, Spirit Soul Radio Network, and more. Stay tuned for more of the best in urban conservative talk. Time for an unpleasant blind guy, conservative bite. I like progressives. Well, that's right, I said it. I like them because they want to see the homeless housed, the hungry fed, and the sick healed. Everyone wants those things, so that's very laudable. When you begin having problems, though, progressives, is when your leaders prove that they care more about their own power and money than they do about the people they claim to champion, and when their irritating, yet barky, ankle bitey lap dogs in establishment media display the kind of hypocrisy that makes anyone with two brain cells to rub together turn away from them and towards the new mainstream media. Now, we all remember Yannicka written in Salon on June the 18th by Chauncey de Berga with the title, Charleston Church Massacre, The Violence White America Must Answer For. Well, that was June 18th. Not quite a month later, on July the 17th, Sean Ealing, yeah, he's Ellen, all right, posted an article in Salon titled, Bobby Jindal Should Just Shut Up. His simple-minded, dishonest Chattanooga comments make things worse. In the June 18th article, De Vega held every white person in the United States of America responsible for the act of one racist a-hole. It wasn't about the fact that the Charleston shooter himself was responsible for his own racist attitude and his own actions. It was about saying, in effect, that every white person had to look themselves in the mirror and admit that they were the problem, that they were responsible. It was an unapologetic, blanket condemnation of every white person in the United States of America. A month later, Governor Bobby Jindal said in an interview with Breitbart, It's time for the White House to wake up and tell the truth. And the truth is that radical Islam is at war with us, and we must start by being honest about that. There have been many bad things that have happened under President Obama. One that stands out to me was the horrible shooting at Fort Hood, which was clearly an act of terrorism by a radical Islamist. Yet, the White House labeled that horrible act as workplace violence. This is grotesque. You cannot defeat evil until you admit that it exists. Now, Mr. Ellen called that statement trite. Bobby Jindal said, What's not acceptable is people that want to come and conquer us. That's not immigration, by the way. That's colonization. And Mr. Ellen called that statement preposterously stupid. 
But the best line in Mr. Allen's article is where he writes, Exaggerating every isolated attack into an apocalyptic threat plays perfectly into the enemy's narrative. Now there are two things happening with that line. The first is the standard progressive narrative that somehow Islamic terrorism is the fault of someone else. It's almost always an isolated incident that has nothing to do with Islam. And the other thing is that that line points out the breathtaking hypocrisy of Salon itself. In June, every white person is responsible for the Charleston shooting. In July, the horrific attack on our military personnel by a Muslim terrorist is the responsibility of that individual only. You see, progressives, admire your sentiments about the poor as much as I do. Your leaders and their establishment media butt cleaners can never seal the deal with me because they have a problem with telling the truth. Dylan Roof was a racist who committed a horrible act and must pay the ultimate penalty. Muhammad Poopbag Aziz was inspired by an ideology that wants to replace civilization with Sharia. The evidence is there for everyone to see. In the month of Ramadan, mm -hmm. Islam inspired 314 terror attacks, 63 suicide bombings. Those resulted in 2,988 dead and 3,696 injured. My producer friends, may I humbly suggest that if you want to draw more people to your cause, you begin to address the hypocrisy within your own leader's servants that blames all white people for the evil of one racist one month and refuses to recognize that Islam has inspired its followers to inflict so much death and pain in the next. This has been an unpleasant blind guy, conservative fight. <laughs> Yeah, mama. Ah, mama, she ta. Ta. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. It is the Accepted Conservative Show live from the nation's capital. I love that carnival entry. My wife. Thank y'all so much. My wife actually. I made this agreement with my wife uh, 15 years ago. Uh, because our wedding night uh, was chaotic. <laughs> she busts out of laughter. <laughs> Uh, both of us being single parents getting married together, uh, we brought our children together, and of course, uh, there was no problem with our children together, but they were being kept by other family members, and when you get other family members with their own vision and values together with your children, who are uniquely interested in other people's visions and values, uh, because they are in a household that's so stern and so Jesus oriented, <laughs> it makes it difficult to, uh, well, after that, uh, my, uh, when you have a young wife and, well, you really can't enjoy your wedding night because you're disciplining children, you have to get up and go and drive across town to rescue your children or That morning, I sat down with my wife uh, over breakfast. Uh, we, we were traveling to Delaware uh, to go Christmas shopping uh, after our wedding. It, it's amazing. Someday I'll write a book and tell you how bizarre my life uh, has been and how my wife has put up with it. <laughs> um, our first anniversary, I actually had to give a speech. Um, <laughs> And she, forget it, forget it. But anyway, uh, I made a, I made an agreement with my wife that every year I would send her on a cruise. Because after 358 days with me, 
you need at least seven day break from me. And so I made certain that every year my wife went on a cruise. Now, my wife is scheduled to go on a cruise next year. It's already taken care of. I already, already paid for it. I already planned it. Uh, and a lot of people say, why do you send your wife away for a week? Uh, she deserves it. I am that crazy. <laughs> she, does, she deserves that time away. So when I was listening to the Carnival Intrigue song that was playing there, I was thinking, that's my wife enjoying herself, having a good time, uh, and, and relaxing before she comes back home for another 358 days and deal with me. So I want to welcome you all back to the Exceptional Conservative Show. We're talking about character tonight, and we're talking about the virtues of victorious people. The first thing we have to accept is the fact that our freedom and our liberty, we either gave it away or it was stolen from us. And I don't know about you, but if you grew up in the hood and somebody took something from you and you came home without it, your mama will make you get up from your teary-eyed situation and go fight to get your stuff back. Even if you lost that fight, okay, it was sending a signal that you're not going to take crap off nobody. Now, I don't know about you, but that's the way I grew up. So I grew up thinking I'm not going to take any crap off anybody. I'm not going to let anybody take my stuff. Uh, I'm going to fight for everything that I have. Uh, that's my property. It's valuable to me. And because my property is valuable to me, it's worth protecting. Because my children are valuable to me, they're worth protecting. Because my wife is valuable to me. So valuable that every year I make certain that she goes on a cruise. Uh, she's so valuable to me that she's worthy of protection. The house that we have is so valuable to us that it's worth protection. That's why we have keys that go into a lock to keep the lock closed to keep people out who don't belong in the house. Now, I don't know about you and this open borders thing, uh, but quite frankly, mm, let me just put it this way. Open borders is like open house. Okay? And open houses are only good for one thing, selling them. Alright? I'm not willing to sell my citizenship away. Alright? Period. The bottom line in our pursuit is the admittance that we have given away our freedom and our liberty or it's been taken from us. And if it has been either one of those, we have to fight to get it back. Now, there's some people who are rhetorical when it comes to conservatism. Some people have great oratory skills. Some people are great writers. But they're not willing to fight. In the Declaration of Independence, it, it mentions three things. It mentions our lives, our wealth, our honor. Our lives, our wealth, our honor. Those are the three things that we're willing to sacrifice in order to maintain our freedom and liberty. So the first thing we have to realize is that we have to take the principle back. Taking the principle back, and let me just go to the etymology dictionary again for principle. We have to take the origin back. We have to take the source back. We have to take the beginning back. We have to take the rule of conduct back. We have to take the axiom back. We have to take the basic assumption back. We have to take the elemental aspect of a craft or discipline back. It is the origin that we have to take back. Now, there are those who are telling us right now uh, that... The, the, the system is fixed so that we're going to lose. But I tell you that you're not supposed to because the original principle is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Everything else after that is a corruption of that life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. So how do we become victorious people? How do we move from the fact of having given away or having it stolen from us, that principle of life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, how do we get it back? Well, let's make it very clear as we're going along here. So we talked about principles. That is the foundation. It is the origin. And let's just be very, very clear. Uh, the founding fathers understood that there was a creator. 
No, they had not met him personally. But they understood the invisible hand of God. They understood Adam Smith. They understood that someone awakened their spirit every morning and there was a word in which they could find that someone. So there was a creator. And that he had given certain supernatural laws to men in their natural state that they were willing and are supposed to protect as far as death. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. So literally, the general law of nature is what we're looking at. Nature's laws. God, the creator, gave us natural laws off of his supernatural power that we were supposed to protect. Well, we didn't protect them. So it requires us to pursue victory. Now, in order to have a victory, it's going to require supremacy. Absolute supremacy. Now, some people are sitting back and saying, what are you talking about, Ken? Isn't that, isn't that racial? No, that's, that's not it. Supremacy. Well, in order to win World War II, the U.S. had to show that it was the ultimate military power in all of the world. The ultimate military power in all of the world. It established supremacy. I see, okay, uh, and supreme. No, not the singers. When we talk about supreme, we're talking about the highest, above all, situated above. Now, why do I say that to you? Because there are many false prophets in the conservative movement. I'm going to type that in for you. Uh, and you can take it for the grain of salt that it was or is. Okay, there are false prophets in conservatism. They don't necessarily believe the ideals or the way of life that conservatism requires. They don't believe in Christianity. They don't believe in constitutionalism. And they don't believe in capitalism. So if you were to take, and, and remember, I mentioned Adam Smith earlier, the invisible hand. If you are to take any one piece away from that circle, from that fixture, okay, it's not the truth. It's not the way. It's not the life. Dave Miller writes, it's like how the Bears established supremacy over the Chargers. You're exactly right. They pulled that game out at the end. They would not give up. They would not give in. They would not give it over. So, there are some conservatives who are false prophets. There are some who side with the Marxists in Missouri. There are some who believe that if you threaten not to play football, and I think the president of that university, Tom Wolf, is an absolute coward, because I would have challenged him to him and told him, hey, listen, you don't play this week, fine, you do your protest, uh, but you won't be playing for the rest of the season. And in fact, your scholarship will be in question next year. We're going to find people who want to play. McKinnon! McKinnon! Uh, what about racism? Uh, what about racism? Let me ask you this question. And I can ask you anything because the underground professor allows me to. When those football players stopped playing football, did racism stop? Did prejudice stop? Did sexism stop? But no, they were fighting for 
They were fighting for the institution. Did they win? Well, if you are a conservative and you're saying that they won, I understand where you're coming from. Yeah, they won, but they won because they took away your liberty and your freedom. And you're willing to compromise it away and not even fight to get it back. You see, they didn't solve any problems. What they did was establish domain. They established supremacy. One of the first things that the professor, one of the, well, she wasn't a professor, she works in the communication department, but one of the first things she did when the press came to cover the story is to ask the press to leave. So they were trying to get rid of the free press. And when the gentleman who was taking photographs would not leave, she ran out and asked some beefy people to come over and force this photographer away. So if you tell me, sir, or madam, and you happen to be a conservative, that they won, yes, they won, but they took away something from you. Individuals who seek dominion over your principles of conservatism, capitalism, Christianity and constitutionalism. If they seek supremacy over you, then they have taken away your freedom and your liberty. They have taken the first principles away. You must be willing to fight to get them back. But that requires character. That requires character. And you must have the character to say that your values, your beliefs, your ethics, are higher than theirs and worth fighting for. When we come back in the fourth quarter, I want to talk with you about virtue. I want to talk with you about the founding fathers on values, morals, and ethics, and how those are so essential to understanding what we must do to take back our nation. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not going to be an easy fight, and it certainly won't get any easier if every time there's an opportunity for us to take back dominion, to take back territory, to take away uh, the uh, Marxist literary strategies, that the Maoism that took place in Missouri. Uh, do you understand what happened in Missouri? They now have the cops that are under federal oversight. The St. Louis police, which is under federal oversight, now have said that individuals who use hate speech must be reported to the police. Hate speech. What exactly is hate speech? Anything that offends. So literally, you have lumps now running throughout the city of St. Louis because you can't speak without offending. Notice also one thing, and I know i got to go to a break, but notice one other thing. It is so amazing that those who say that they are for Black Lives Matters, those who say they're for the Occupy movement, those who say that they want equality, those who tell you that they want all men to have equivalency and justice. Notice how the first thing they wanted to do was take away your ability to protest, your ability to cover the protest, and your first ability to speak. So, if you can't speak, then you don't need a gun. Because you have nothing else to protect. You have no life. You have no liberty. You have no freedom. Your pursuit of happiness ends. And there's no sense of worrying about protection because only the radicals will protect what they believe is of worth and value. Ladies and gentlemen, what happened in Missouri should really frighten you to the core. Because the Obama administration has introduced Maoism, and it's very subtle. It'll take you by surprise. 
but it took 35 million people in China by surprise. They were all killed by Chairman Mao. A cultural revolution took place. Ladies and gentlemen, is the cultural revolution being offered by the Obamas, by the Clintons, by the Black Lives Matters, by the Missoula football team, is that what you want? Because if it is, there's a slow boat to China waiting for you. Because I ain't letting you turn this country into anything other than what its origins was about. We'll be back with more of the best in Urban Conservative Talk. The Exceptional Conservative Show is riding high. One more time. Hi, my name is Chris Barnard. I'm the executive chef of a few restaurants. And today I'm walking you through some of the meals that we prepare here. <laughs> So we're making a pizza, we use a fresh Italian sausage, and they cook here and slice it up. Our pizza dough is in-house made, our pizza sauce is in-house made, so everything is fresh and easy. This is our Thai curry chicken. Uh, the sauce is made with coconut milk and a Thai red curry. It is a juicy chicken thigh as well as some mixed vegetables. Served with jasmine rice and pita bread. So now, we're going to prepare our famous blackened bulakia and grits. Our fish and grits on the menu. and our meal will be complete. Let me tell you about our infused tea burgers. When we keep the spice up just a little bit with our infused sauce. We start off with 80-20 USDA ground chuck ham patty burgers, like half a pound of burgers, and we're going to grill it to perfection. Gentlemen, you need to order it now. Uh, 6339 Allentown Road, Temple Hills, Maryland, 20748 301 Infuse, infuse.com. Get the best burgers, the best food, the best service, the best people in town. Ladies and gentlemen, we know how to start off a show. And we started off with Senora Cabrera. This is Spanish with Senora Cabrera. Today we will learn how to say the Pledge of Allegiance in Spanish. In English, we say, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now, in Spanish, we say, Juro fidelidad a la bandera de los Estados Unidos de América y a la República que representa una nación bajo Dios, indivisible, con libertad y justicia para todos. Muy bien. Practice your pledge of allegiance, and the more you practice, the faster you will memorize. I'll see you later. And I will see you now. Welcome to the Exceptional Conservative Show. We're coming to you live from the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. Coming up right now in the nation's capital, the city where 140 people have been murdered. We will have Janice Hall, J. Hall World Report. It's amazing how they hide all that news from you, huh? 
uh, Janice Hall, Jay Hall World Report, where we try to bring the international information news to the kitchen table. Good, good evening, Janice Hall, Jay Hall World Report. It's a pleasure and an honor and a great joy to have you here on Tuesday night. Thank you, and always a pleasure to be here. Listen, not much going on in the world, huh? <laughs> no, never, never. never. Uh, while they are debating uh, tonight uh, what they would do in the case of a national business matter, uh, there are some things that are happening in the world uh, that people here need to really pay some attention to. And I, I, I want to go to the uh, first big news and the plane accident, the Russian uh, jet. Um, we were hearing that uh, there was a possible, uh, let, let's say, uh, mechanical failure. Uh, stuff happens at 30,000 feet. Uh, so is, is this a human error problem, or is there something more to this story? Um, so... There's still no actual, you know, like actual confirmation of what brought the plane down. However, um, the reports and rumors uh, definitely seem to be that the plane was probably brought down by a bomb. And ISIS has claimed responsibility for it. Um, we don't necessarily know if that's true. Sometimes terrorists claim responsibility for actions that are not their own. Um, but, uh, I would certainly say that it's completely within the realm of possibility that it is indeed the case that ISIS did this, um, and it's very much likely in retaliation for, uh, Russia's involvement, um, you know, in Syria and against them. Now, now, ISIS was originally a radical group. Uh, or a bunch of radicals that were, were going against the Syrian president, I believe. Is, is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. And, and all of a sudden, the Russian pri Russian president, forgive me, used to be prime minister, Vladimir Putin uh, noticed that uh, there was a potential for Syria to fall uh, because it has like four civil wars going on at the same time, and the president of Syria... Uh, is in a weakened state. Uh, and apparently, they decided to come in to do something that the U.S. chose not to do. Have they been successful? And what, it, what exactly was that? And have they been successful? Um, they, I mean, I don't think that we've seen huge, significant success as of yet. Though I will say... Um, Syrian forces were able to recapture some territory just recently that had been uh, held in ISIS in its control for the last couple of years, um, and that's very and that is very likely due to uh, you know R Russia's involvement. Um, it lo also is looking like Russia is going to be sending more troops to the region, um, and and very likely increasing their presence in, in Syria. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, probably partially because of the, the bombing of the plane. Yeah. Um, and quite honestly, I don't necessarily think that, that they're wrong. Um, the U.S. has been very critical of Russia in this. Uh, they, you know, complained about... Um, we, we complained about, you know, Russia, you know, going in and asserting its power, you know, very similar to as they have done in Ukraine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I really, I really don't think, you know, we have a leg to stand on here. And while, you know, I, I agree that what Russia has done in Ukraine is, is wrong, um, and, and don't necessarily like to see uh, Russia's power around the world grow, we had the opportunity many, many, many times 
Mm -hmm. So pick Turkey and Syria and to deal with ISIS and to deal with that entire situation that's there. And we did not. Mm -hmm. And now that if, if Russia wants to be involved, I I don't I don't think that we can say that we shouldn't that they shouldn't be. You know, natural resources is another issue in all of this. Um, and, you know, it would be naive to think that Russia is looking out for the best interests of the Syrian president uh, and the good people of the Middle East. <laughs> uh, Russia has always sought a access either to the west, to the Atlantic Ocean, or to the south, uh, to the Gulf, uh, or to the uh, Indian Ocean. Uh, having uh, having this type of access uh, opens the door to them making uh, an attempt into Iraq. Uh, and we've already seen where they have uh, actually mistakenly bombed certain places in northern Iran. Uh, so, uh, in, in all of this, and with the U.S. sending 50 special ops troops to uh, the Middle East, uh, is this is Syria really the concern for Russia, or are they has Vladimir Putin already decided I'm going to expand territory as quickly as I can as long as President Obama is in office? <laughs> some of both. Um, mm -hmm. I think he definitely does see an opportunity uh, with Obama essentially being you know, quite weak on foreign policy. I think he does see an opportunity to uh, you know, assert dominance in that region and to you know, kind of take, take over some of the, the influence that the U.S. has had there. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, and as you were saying, it, it is also about resources and location. Um, you know, we, the, the U.S. has had a pretty significant president, presence in the Middle East for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, I'm sure that Russia would very much also like to have a military presence in that region. And, you know, if they can swing it, Syria could potentially be that location. Exactly. I mean, cause you, you you have Syria. And we're talking with Janice Hall, J Hall World Report. You know, this is my favorite part of the show uh, during the course of the week. Uh, talking with Janice Hall about world affairs, breaking it down to the kitchen table level. But you have a ostensible giant in Russia, which holds the gonads of natural resources for Europe in their hand. They see that China is expanding into the South China Sea. Uh, why not go for it? go for it, right? Why not go uh, and and try to go to the, go as far down to the Gulf uh, as you possibly can, or into the Indian Sea as you possibly can at this particular moment, where you're not going to be refuted by a president uh, who is not necessarily considered a military genius around the world. I, I can't answer that. Why, why not? It seems like a perfectly logical, rational thing to do to me. <laughs> it would be fun. It would be fun. Now, uh, Bashir al-Assad, the president of Syria, uh, has virtually been out of the limelight um, since maybe about three years ago. Uh, and, and that's virtually because uh, all stuff was hitting the fan at this particular juncture. Syria was going downhill. Uh, now we hear from President Vladimir Putin. We talked about this last week that but uh, Al uh, uh, Bashir al-Assad um, isn't essential for the leadership of Syria. Uh, do you believe that they have made an arrangement for Bashir to leave Syria? Uh, and for uh, Vladimir Putin to set up a puppet king 
uh, with a and have then access to the Mediterranean Sea? It's possible that they've done something like that already. Um, I don't necessarily uh, see that, that they have. Um, mm -hmm. I think that that's still probably perhaps a little premature with the situation in Syria. There's still just a tremendous amount of, of fighting, and I think that um, mm -hmm. you know, they're probably currently more interested in uh, you know, killing with the situation of ISIS and, mm -hmm. and the conflict that's happening there uh, than, you know, starting mm -hmm. to establish order. Um, but I think that that is entirely something that could eventually happen. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I want to talk to you, since we're on the conversation of ISIS, uh, and you and I both know that this immigration crap uh, that's happening in Europe has nothing to do about saving mamas and babies. Uh, I think of it as a, a invasion by ISIS and other radical uh, Mohammedans uh, into Europe and then eventually into North America, the U.S., Canada, and so on. Uh, but in California, uh, there was a campus stabber, uh, and he had written a radical manifesto uh, which parlayed into an affinity with the ISIS organization. Uh, should we be mindful of that incident in California? Uh, or is that really a lone wolf scenario and we should basically look at this as a public safety or crime issue? Uh, I, I think I think primarily it is, um, it's, it's a terror, terrorist issue. Mm -hmm. um, essentially what he did was, it, basically from the reports that I have seen, it looks as if essentially he was attempting an act, an act of terrorism um, with, you know, um, mm -hmm. extremist ideology being the, the the primary motivating factor mm -hmm. for his actions um, of basically you know, trying to uh, stab and or get someone. He didn't actually end up killing anyone. Uh, however, that was generally not for lack of trying. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe he should have stayed in camp just one more week to learn how to do it. <laughs> Possibly. So... The, the what terrorism has now become, which is more of this lone wolf type action or a single individual person who may or may not have ties mm -hmm. um, to ISIS. Uh, and I think that it's, it's very likely that as, you know, ISIS continues to not be dealt with, um, and for that matter, for that matter, as Islamic extremism continues to not be dealt with, we're very much likely going to see attacks like this again. So I, I want to ask you, in, in terms of national security, because uh, Homeland Security has already established the fact that these guys who are coming over here from Europe, 100,000 strong, there's no way, there's just no way possible for them to investigate each and every one of them and to know for certain that these are not terrorists. Uh, a, right. a, should we not admit them? Uh, and B, uh, should we establish a certain criteria for watching them while they're here? Uh, I, I think you asked both questions. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> have to admit them. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that Europe necessarily had to admit them. Uh, however, if that is something that they wish to do, uh, then you know that's that's something that they can that they can do of their own accord. Um, but you're right, a hundred thousand is a very large number. 
And to keep tabs on that many people requires tremendous amount of, you know, resources and money and effort, and it's just very unlikely to get to, you know, the attention that it should. Exactly. I agree with you. And uh, we're already dealing with an invasion to the south. We certainly do not need the invasion uh, from the east uh, with Europe sending its uh, unpalatable refugees here. Uh, it, it, you know, and I'm not anti-immigration. I just want immigration to work, and it doesn't work when you don't know who's coming in or who's leaving out. Uh, speaking, speaking of uh, expanding territory... <laughs> China uh, has met with the Philippines, or will be meeting with them uh, again, uh, and they're hoping to sway the Philippines on their side. Uh, yeah! <laughs> this, is, uh, this is almost an entertaining... This is almost an entertaining read. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, I'm almost laughing myself. <laughs> uh, and I just wanted to let everyone know, we've been covering this story longer than everyone else on the conservative networks. Uh, we told everyone that this was going to be a problem, and everyone looked at us and laughed or, or said it in the little chat rooms or whatever, that this was not going to be major. Uh... But this is seriously major because China is slowly inching its way into the Pacific and the South China Sea uh, at the angst of Japan, South Korea, Thailand, Vietnam, uh, Australia. Okay. Yeah, the Philippines. <laughs> so, why did they pick, why did they pick the Philippines? <laughs> why did they pick the Philippines? Okay, so, <laughs> basically, Philippines, like all those other countries that we just mentioned, okay, is unhappy with China's encroachment uh, into the South China Sea. <laughs> and so China's response to the Philippines being unhappy about this is that, they're, they say that they hope the Philippines can make a wider choice in <laughs> a solution to the dispute in China. Uh, the dispute in, in the, the South China Sea. Can you repeat the phrase that the Chinese used for the Philippines? <laughs> okay. We hope the Philippines can make a wider choice. <laughs> you. Oh, what a threat. So they're now threatening the Philippines uh, diplomatically. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, so they're basically, not, they're basically saying we are completely correct, but mm. the Philippines is totally wrong, and if you don't want a confrontation <laughs> the Philippines, you need to change your stance. <laughs> Because unwise. <laughs> oh, we know the Philippines made a mistake. We'll look over it, but you better change your mind. Um, but, yes. uh, but now they're beginning to use diplomatic threats uh, against each of those particular nations. Uh, where is the U.S. in all of this? Uh, are we just going to allow China to threaten the Philippines and virtually Japan uh, and all the other nations quietly? Uh, to, so that China has its way? Well, we generally have. Wow. Since this has been going on, which is why China continues to do it and feels, you know, quite emboldened to tell the Philippines that it's being stupid. Um, <laughs> at least according to them. <laughs> uh, don't they sound like the mafia right about here? <laughs> A little bit. We're going to give you an offer that you can't refuse the Philippines. Exactly. <laughs> want to talk with you real quick also about um, Turkey. Uh, because we've been watching this also since about the beginning of the year. And Turkey looks like its, uh, it's, it's foundations are beginning to shred slightly. 
uh, why are they worried about the European Union and, and why are they talking about changing the Constitution? Okay, so uh, Turkey had elections recently, mm -hmm. and that basically, uh, you know, changed up some of the the people who are in, in power. And we've seen since this election happened that they have been more aggressive in how they have dealt with the Kurds, and not necessarily the Kurds in their own country, but those that are, that are also in Iraq. And one of the things that they're looking to do is to make the president's role uh, more powerful, essentially. So basically they want to change the Constitution. Um, and the, the EU is, is, you know, to some degree, slightly disturbed by this mm -hmm. because of what it could have you know, what it could imply. Um, it's generally, generally not a good thing when more power is centralized. Um, mm -hmm. And so, I, I, I think that in the, in the case of Turkey, they, you know, have been uh, one of the very few Middle Eastern countries that has been, you know, relatively able to conduct its government in a secular way. Yeah. And while we're not necessarily seeing anything with this change in the Constitution that would necessarily imply that that, that is at risk, um, I think that as we have all seen, and we all know that, that Middle Eastern politics is, very volatile and very fragile, and any change in power structure or a country's constitution could have unintended consequences that really greatly damage that country. Janice, you seem to be so much further ahead uh, than your peers in terms of the foreign policy issues, uh, and I give you gravitas in terms of that. Um, but we, we and we talked about this last week and a couple of weeks before that that Turkey is having issues within with civil disorder, uh, and now the change in the or, or the expectation as a result of the voting of a change in the constitution and Turkey looks like it's going the way of Egypt where it's losing its control as a secular uh, nation. Uh, doesn't this impact? First and foremost, the U.S., and then secondly, doesn't this impact the way Russia sees uh, the Middle East if Turkey is beginning to, you know, quiver a bit? Um, yes. Uh, basically, Turkey, Turkey is important to the Middle East, mm -hmm. and while they've not taken a particularly active role in the... Uh, any of the politics that has really been going on in the last few years in that region. Yeah. Um, you know, they have, at the very least, been an example that, you know, you can have, you know, an, an Islamic country that still operates in a secular, you know, in a secular way. And I would say that most people would say that it has, it has served them well. Yeah. And if that changes, um, you know, I think, I don't think anybody really wants to see any of the countries in the Middle East become more, you know, or yeah, no, nobody wants to see the governments in the Middle East become, you know, more based upon religious law. There you go. So we're beginning to see a radicalism. Uh, take place in a place. Uh, this is dangerous. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, this, the whole movie is dangerous. Exactly. This is uh, like Eric adding kerosene every week to a different fire. It's it's always up the gar. What's the big story that we should be looking forward to uh, next week, um, uh, Janice? Uh, it, 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 I, I mean, we, we're already shaky on the uh, Russia going into Syria and also uh, northern Iraq. Uh, is that the big story, or, or should we be concerned about the invasion uh, by the refugees? Um, I think for top on topics, I, I'm probably uh, going to be really interested to see how Russia responds to uh, the Syria situation, and the U.S. response to the Syria situation. Um, I think it's one thing I didn't mention, though, I'll do it now real quickly, is it's very interesting to note that the U.S., after years of not doing anything about Syria, only now begins to contemplate doing something other than Russians getting involved, which to me seems almost ludicrous. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that I think will be really interesting, and just to see if any more information on the claim that was brought down, if, if there's any more uh, information on that as well. Uh, is uh, just real quick because we're we're two months away from them making the announcement. But is Vladimir Putin the man of the year for Time Magazine? Uh, well, this is possible. He's had a few good years, so yeah, he's completely wiped the clock uh, of Obama. Janice Hall, the J Hall World Report. Janice, we love you and we thank you so much for coming on Tuesday nights. Thank you. Oh, it's fun. All right. Janice Hall. I, we love Janice Hall uh, and love her coming on the program. It is, for me, the most exciting part of the week because she brings world issues to the kitchen table. Um, and a lot of the stuff you would not hear on your local news, a lot of the stuff you would not hear uh, even on your cable news network. Uh, and this is the power of conservative media. That's why I love SHR Media, Pundit Press Media, uh, SHR, I'm sorry, SHR, Pundit Press, Rebooting Liberty, uh, Conservative Commandos Radio Network, and so many others uh, that drive the message home. Uh, that it's going to take more than just wishing, hoping, and wanting uh, America to take the lead. Uh, we're going to have to take back the principles. Uh, and when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about virtue and its place in a victorious people who have character. You're listening tonight to the Exceptional Conservative Show live from the nation's capital. Let's put the meatball parade on. <laughs> Right swipe. 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 Right swipe.
look expensive Sitting on a mountaintop looking all offensive I was about to ask, how's the air up there? But based on this pic, I guess you don't really care and Lots of chicks in the pic, not sure which one's you Them cigarettes are taking y'all from tens to twos And one thing's true about your whole crew None of you cigarellas gonna be my boo Smoking with a tiger? Let's wipe that While you're on a hang glider? Let's wipe that Smoking while you're healthy? Let's wipe that Smoking all stealthy? Let's wipe that Smoking with a duck face? Let's wipe that Welcome back to the Exceptional Conservative Show, live from the nation's capital. All right, we have been on the air going on five years. I, I, February 28th, 2011, we stepped out there and became the Exceptional Conservative Show. We were on the air once a week. Uh, then we went on the air a little bit later on, I believe, uh, to four times a week. Uh, and now we're virtually on every single day of the week. <laughs> we virtually are. Uh, I think the only day off, is, this must be because I'm Jewish or something. I, I'm not really, I'm not Jewish. Uh, but I have a Judaic or, or, origin. Um, uh, the only day that we're off is Friday. Well, no, not really. Um, we are literally on every single day of the week. The Exceptional Conservative Show it's either Sunday mornings at 7 a.m., an American conservative exploration of the inspired word of God. Monday through Thursday from 9 to 11, uh, the Exceptional Conservative Show, which is live from Washington, D.C. Uh, on Friday afternoons, I make an appearance on Lonely Pond Poindexter's A Lion Chaser Show. And on 3 o'clock p.m. on WNJC 1360 a.m., uh, we, uh, I appear as the conservative commando, uh, the exception of one Ken McClinton, uh, with the benevolent dictator, uh, Rick Trader. And on Saturdays, I co-host with my good friend, uh, Dr. Michael Jones, the underground professor, who is our Thursday night guest at 10 o'clock. Um, we co-host New Day Black and Red at 5 p.m on WNJC 1360 AM. So literally, this program, or this host, is on seven days a week. It's amazing, simply amazing, seven days a week. You can be a part of that seven day a week theme, either one day out of the week, or all seven if you like, just by going to the Exceptional Conservative Show dot com and getting your update dated. So there we are. We have reached the point of the program where there will be no more commercials. And this is, a, this is the Underground Professor's favorite part of the show. You don't have to worry about any more commercials. You get the, uh, the gumption, the, the, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And this week we are talking about character. At least for the past two weeks, for two days, we've been talking about character. Uh, and... Quite frankly, uh, there are concerns in our culture uh, about uh, the character of the people who are in leadership. Their character is in question because they have chosen to compromise values, morals, and ethics. That compromise is built on the framework that they believe that they are the sovereign and you are the ruled. They are the ruler and you are the ones that must obey. That's why we must take back the principle first. Take back first principles. We have to go back to the origins of this thing, which means that we have to be constitutionalists, and we have to be strict constitutionalists. We have to look at the Constitution for what it meant at the time, not what it's interpreted for in this time. And we're not saying that the Founding Fathers knew all about um, 
Maglav. There would be bullet trains. Uh, but they understood principles that make people sovereign and free. They believed that our economy is built from the ground up. That our republic is governed from the ground up. That our faith is the only thing that virtually is from top down. And as a result of it being top down, we have been graced uh, with the authority to know what values, what morals, and what ethics we must exude and we must follow. Knowing our values, knowing our morals, knowing our ethics tells us not only what we believe, but why we believe what we believe and the impact of what we believe will have on other people. Let's first go with the concept of what values are. And if we're going to be a victorious people, we most certainly want to spend a little bit of time talking about our values. Now, values are the rules by which we make decisions about right and wrong. Should and shouldn't good and bad. So values are the rules by which we make decisions. Values are the rules. So if we're looking at the concept of first principles, then we would not look at the interpretation of the rule based on a modern a perverted look at a ruling, but we will have to go back to the origins to understand what it was meant for and then how it is to be applied to. The application of the rule can evolve. However, the rule itself should never evolve. The evolution of the rule means that it's taken off the foundations of the one, the sovereign one who put it there and is corrupted and compromised and put someplace else for future usage by those who have control and oppress. Values are the rules by which we make decisions. So what is the cornerstone of our rule making. Should it be Playboy? Should it be a, a lobbyist from K Street? Or should it be the Holy Bible? Hmm. In order to have rules that is that are built on right and wrong so that you may make decisions, the whole concept of what is right and wrong has to have a governing system that is greater than the human governing system. Because the human governing system is built on personal interpretation. What is in my best interest, a self-interest. Those are not by which values can be built. For in my case, I might have a farm that isn't doing well selling soybeans, but I could actually grow uh, heroin, or at least the poppy seeds for heroin, and make a killing. In my self-interest, that's the best decision I can make. It is a right decision in my best interest. I have determined that. Because the rules are adjusted based on what's in my best interest. However, if the rules are standardized and built on a certain firm foundation that is not built on my self-interest, but the self-interest of those who created me, the one who actually has rule over what is right and what is wrong, then that poppy seed thing may not necessarily be in the best interest of all. 
So I would have to make a decision on what is right and what is wrong. My values have to be in place in order for me to judge rightly. My rules must be built upon a firm foundation so that I might make decisions about what's good and what's bad, what should be done and what shouldn't be done. Values are the beliefs of a person or social group in which they have an emotional investment either for or against something. So your beliefs are your values. But do your beliefs line up with capitalism, conservatism, constitutionalism, Christianity? If they don't line up with those particular things, there might be a problem with your interpretation of what's right and what's wrong. Let's go with this for a second. We believe that by the standard set in the U.S. House that a budget should be balanced. The Founding Fathers did not want excessive debt because they knew that once you began voting yourself money, you would actually lose the principle by which you self-govern. Uh, it then would become a best interest governed, and then eventually it becomes a tyranny. So a balanced budget or a debtless society is what the Founding Fathers were aiming for. But if you believe that it is far easier and better for a nation to expend a great amount of debt, even at the cost of those who may inherit it, so that you might prosper today, then your interpretation, your values, your beliefs might be askew from what the Founding Fathers believed and thus should not be followed. So if we were to take back the principle thing, how we see what the Founding Fathers desired, now notice what I said desired, not what they individually believed, because they were all individuals, but what they desired most is that they, we would be a free nation without a great amount of debt. What is right is that we are closer to a debt-free nation. What is wrong is when we expend a great deal of wealth, calling it debt, in the hopes that we may get it back. So our values and our beliefs have to point to something that's right and wrong. Individuals who do not wish to use the term right and wrong will often try to use emotional candor to cloud your judgment. To be supreme, to have absolute battle proficiency and exceptionalism that you take out your enemy, you cannot compromise on right and wrong. There is no second chance in battle on right and wrong. You must choose what is right in order to be victorious. Those who will be electing in November have to be convinced, have to be coerced, have to be taught. that simply voting with your emotions alone is going to be prosperous for all. It won't be because it would be limited to your personal interpretation. You must go back to what the Founding Fathers desired 
take the principles from there and install them in the present day. So let's take another look at something. I want you to take a look or listen to our founding fathers. Because often people refer to our founding fathers and their absence in quotation leaves us to the heightened hyperbolic consternations of those with emotional bent. Daniel Webster writes this, If religious books are not widely circulated among the masses in this country, I do not know what is going to become of us as a nation. If truth be not diffused, error will be. Notice how he is making reference to right and wrong. He's saying our values are based on our beliefs, and they are religious beliefs. And in that particular day, the religion of choice was not Mohammedism. It wasn't Hinduism. It was Judeo-Christian driven. So what he's saying here is, if the Bible is taken out, that word that gave us a supreme foundation by which we could build upon the pillars of truth, justice, and of course the American way, then we will have nothing but error. And solely the foundation will remain strong, but the building will become weak. Daniel Webster goes on to say, If God and his word are not known and received, the devil in his works will gain the ascendancy. If the evangelical volume does not reach every hamlet, the pages of a corrupt and licentious licentious, forgive me, and literature will. If the power of the gospel is not felt throughout the length and breadth of the land, anarchy and misrule and marry my bouncer, if you diss or you diss me, you will be dismissed, refer to the fact that we're in an age of anarchy, and we're in that age of anarchy because, like Daniel Webster said, the gospel is not felt throughout the length and breadth of the land. There is a need for revival in America. Daniel Webster goes on to say, Degradation and misery, corruption and darkness will reign without mitigation or end. That's the 1823 Every Christian a Publisher. Let's go on, and, and, and maybe I'm erroneous here, uh, but let's take a look at James Madison. James Madison says, We have staked the whole future of American civilization, not upon the power of government, far from it. Every time you hold a town hall meeting, people want to find out what the government going to do. What the government going to do. What the government, what, is there going to be a program? Is there going to be another program? No, it's not going to be another program. You are the program. You are. James Madison goes on to write, and he was quite the pen for early America. We have staked the future of all our political institutions upon the capacity of mankind for self-government upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves, to control ourselves, to sustain ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. Hmm. Values. You know, when we look at that term, and I want to take a look at values real quick, Price equal to the intrinsic worth of a thing. 
degree to which something is useful or estimate estimate uh, estimatable estimable uh, forgive me Mary Brockman has a right the real yardstick isn't the founding fathers it's the heavenly father you are absolutely right Mary absolutely right that's where our belief should be in a heavenly father virtually value is defined as social principle the social principle in order for us to take back our country we must first take back the principle we must first take back the social principle our society is not built on world government or someone with a noble intention doing something for us through the white buildings of Washington. No! It is built upon a social principle of self-governance. The reason why socialists in urban America do not want to tell you that their government has failed is because they do not subscribe to social principle. They don't subscribe to freedom, liberty, and justice. What they subscribe to is totalitarianism. That's why they can sit there and promise you that they will get to something regarding crime in your neighborhood, and they not really do it. Because they want you to kill each other out. They want you to abort your babies. They want you to practice genocide on yourself because you make governing you easier. I don't have to govern someone who can't control themselves. And someone that can control themselves will not ask me to govern them. They can govern themselves. So you see here, the uncontrollable, those who are defiant to the peace and harmony of a neighborhood, to the peace and harmony of a city, require the governance of an oppressor, of a tyrannist, and will submit when there is tyranny in the land. But the righteous, those that know their value, those that know the price equal to the intrinsic worth of their lives will always abide, abound, forgive me, in a period where there is not oppressive rule. Our values, our morals, our ethics make up the part of us, and we haven't even got into morals and ethics yet, and we haven't even really finished the value portion, and we haven't even talked about virtue yet, but the bottom line is that I want to give you virtue before we go, because we're going to run out of time. The concept of virtue works in this regard. You have to have a moral life, and you have to pursue moral excellence. When we come back tomorrow night, Veterans Day, and a solemn day it is, God rest, uh, God bless those veterans who have fought for us and this nation to protect it and keep it and to come home. We'll talk about moral excellence.